space might not seem important. Brexit might seem important. Yeah. Politics might seem important. But space is something which affects all of us and is shaping all of our lives every single day. And as we move forward into space, you know, over the next few decades, it's going to become more and more obvious. <laughs> So thank you so much indeed for joining me today. I suppose one question I've always wanted to ask someone in the space world is this, what's the, what's the one question that you wish more people would ask you about space, but they don't? That's a great question. Um, I think the great thing about space is that um, the more questions we have and the more answers we get, the more mm. questions we're left with. So you know, we go into space because we want to know our origin, where did we come from? We want to know our destiny. You know, Are we gonna go the same way as the dinosaur? And then most importantly of all, we, perhaps most importantly of all, we want to know, are we alone? Yeah. You know, when you look up at the night sky, pretty much every star you can see, there's at least one planet orbiting around it. There are more planets in our universe than there are stars. And that cliche of there being more stars than grains of sands is true. So I guess the question would be is, when are we going to find out if we're alone or not? Because often people ask, are we alone? But they never ask when. Right. And actually, the answer is that within the next few decades, we're going to be able to answer that question of why are we alone? It's not a case of if, but it's a case of when. And it sounds like science fiction. You know, aliens have got mm. quite a bad PR rep. But actually, <laughs> if you look within our own solar system, the planet Mars, Mars was mon much warmer and wetter in the past. There could have been life on Mars. There could still be microbial life. Yep. If you go further out to Jupiter, there's this moon called Europa, an icy shell beneath it, we think there's a, a liquid ocean, and Europa actually gets its energy from the gas giant Jupiter. Mm. You've got raw materials on this moon, and then you've got a horrible liquid ocean, all the key ingredients for life. So all this crazy science fiction stuff is happening right now. The scientists are investigating whether we're alone in the universe, and it's not a, a Hollywood question anymore. Yeah. It's not something reserved for the movies. This is real science which is going on. So I guess my answer to your very good question, which I've never been asked before, would be, <laughs> When are we going to find out whether we're alone or not? Because answering that question in the next few decades changes everything. Because if we can prove, even if it's just microbial life on Mars, mm. and it's separate from Earth, then that means two genesises within this one average solar system. And of course, we know that the universe is teeming with planets, yeah. it's teeming with solar systems. So then the numbers speak for itself. We, we then begin to ask, well, what else is out there? And, then, and but do you, what do you feel the reaction will be when, if this is discovered from the general population? Will they be let down or will they be excited? Will they get the concept of microbial um, organisms or will they be like, well, they're not eight. They're not like what we've seen on telly in terms of aliens. I think most people are curious. Most mm -hmm. people, all of us have that childlike curiosity. It's all of us at some point in our lives have looked up at the night sky and wondered, you've wondered, you know, yeah. everyone who's ever existed. It's what we share in common with pretty much every human that's ever existed, that, mm. that looking up, that wondering. Of course, our understanding is much greater now than it was 100 years ago or 1,000 years ago, but it's something we all share in common. So I can't predict how humans will behave, but it changes everything. Okay. And, and I think at the moment we're in such an exciting era in terms of human spaceflight, where mm. once before it was about these two superpowers, and now space is about all of us. If you've got a cell phone, if you've got a mobile phone, you carry around a space receiver in your pocket because that mobile phone is connected to satellites. So every day you're using space. So really, we're living in this unexpected space age and profound questions such as, are we alone yes. and why do we exist? They're the things we're trying to answer over the next few decades. And, and do you think, I think it's something that's fascinating, we are currently at 100% in a, we're all interested in space moment. And I know through my life, kind of, it's almost been picked and trucked about. Yeah, I agree. Why now and why, why at times has it gone, space seems to be put on the back burner? Because space didn't actually get put on the back burner, space became about all of us. When we went to the moon, mm. more than 50 years ago now, Apollo 11, yeah. it was a, a cold war. It was a race between two superpowers trying to say, we can do a big thing well, and that big thing, space. Okay. Uh, America was first to land on the moon, they claimed they won, and that was the end of the space race. But we didn't stop going to space. What happened is we learned how to use the platform of space right. exploration to actually benefit all of us here on Earth. At the same time, of Kennedy's moon speech back in 1961, we talked about putting communication satellites in space as well as going to the moon and putting weather satellites in space. We now live in a space age, but our space age is that phone you carry around with you. So right. we got sidetracked somewhere along the way. But then at the same time, 
We've got the International Space Station. No one born after November 2000 has known a time when humans haven't been continually living and working in space. So it's not, we haven't got these moon bases, we haven't got these jetpacks, yeah. but instead we've got something a little closer to home. We've been learning how to exist in space, how to survive in space. And now with those skills, we're looking at once again going further. Mm. And with the moon, it was a competition. It was a race between two superpowers. But what the International Space Station has taught us is actually if we want to succeed in space, we need to work together. You've got 16 countries involved in the International Space Station, yeah. including Russia and the United States, which often have conflicting political views on Earth, but they're working together in space. And what we've learned from space is actually we need to work together mm. to go forward. But let me take that. Let me take you back to where you start, started from. Was it, was it like a light bulb moment in space for you? What, what were the first questions you asked yourself? How kind of, when did you look up and decide that actually this is absolutely fascinating and you want to find out more? Genuine answer. My first memory, pretty much one of my first mm. memories is of looking up at the moon. I, my, often my response to questions like, why are you interested in space mm. is, why would you not be interested? We are this one planet in this one average solar yeah. system. Earth seems huge to us, but from the moon, you can cover it with your thumb. You know, from the planet Saturn, we're just a dot and go any further, Earth is a speck. Mm. We think everything on Earth is so important that it is, but then there's also so much out there. Why wouldn't you want to explore? Why wouldn't you want to? You know, we're privileged to be alive in a time when we can ask questions and be part of this, you know, this space age that we're living in. So for me, looking up at the moon was one of my first memories, learning about planet Venus as a child at school and then just being obsessed with space. I didn't yeah. know whether I wanted to be an astronaut or a cosmologist. Yeah. I became neither. Um, <laughs> I, I studied astrophysics yeah. um, and then I ended up being a weather presenter for the BBC before going back into space. But I think all of us have looked up, all of us have that curiosity and all of us are looking for meaning in our life. And mm. actually, space is beyond just science. It's this combination of philosophy science and, and wondering, you know, why do we exist? What else is out there? It's, why wouldn't you want to know? Why wouldn't you want to be part of exploring? Like we all exist today because our ancestors explored the earth. We all exist in the modern world we have today because of those who came before us who explored the earth. Hmm. So how did you kind of, you said kind of you worked for the Z, kind of how did your career take a turn and where did it go and how did you end up coming back, I suppose, Going to back to Earth. To where, to where you are now. <laughs> um, that's a great question. So I um, I got sidetracked um, okay. somewhere along the way. And uh, after doing astrophysics, I went mm. camping around South America. And I wanted to tell stories. So I ended up doing um, journalism and then going to work for the BBC as a weather presenter because the honest truth is I needed a job. They were screen testing. Yeah. And I passed and they gave me the job. Um, and it was a great job because it gave me lots of live TV experience, mm. but my real passion was still for space. So in my free time, I used to sell stories back to, I don't know if I say this actually. <laughs> 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 um, so in my, you know, my passion was for space, but in my free time, I used to um, report about space for the BBC radio, so yeah. BBC Radio 5 Live, and started using more and more time to really push space stories. And then I, I interviewed an astronaut called Piers Sellers. Yes. Um, he was a British-born guy who became an American to fulfill his dream of space. And I think this comes back to the importance of inspiration because I'd got sidetracked somewhere in online. And then interviewing him, this person who'd grown up, he'd, you know, meteorology and, and climate studies is what he specialised in. Yeah. He'd grown up in the UK, but he'd gone to America and he fulfilled his dream for space. And it made me realise that this is it. You've only get one life. You've got to follow your dreams. So I ended up leaving the BBC not long, I think a year after that interview. Did he know the impact he's had? Have you ever told him? Well, it's, it's, a, it's a heartbreaking story, really. So Piers Sellers um, died in 2016. He wrote this incredible piece in the, the New York Times mm. entitled Cancer and Climate Change. So he, whereas Tim Peake, we've all heard of Tim Peake. Yeah, yeah. Because um, Piers Sellers became an American um, to then go into space, um, he didn't get the same celebrity status, yeah, I guess, in the British media. Yeah. But he... Um, he helped to build the International Space Station, um, and then he headed up um, NASA Goddard Space Center okay. looking into climate wow. change. And then one day he wrote this piece for the New York Times entitled Cancer and Climate Change, and he was terminally ill with cancer. Yeah. And in this piece, he wasn't bemoaning his status, but he was basically saying, I'm terminally ill, but the work I do at NASA is better than any bucket list. 
And so he went back to work and spent the last year of his life dedicating his life to the work into climate change because he believed in the power of what space was doing, not just to explore, mm. but to actually improve life on Earth and to, move, you know, to tackle this huge problem that we now face. And um, Piers was in my first kid's book and it inspired me to go yeah. back into space. And I actually um, nominated him for the highest non-governmental award that you can get in the US for services to the space industry. And he got it just before the end of the year. And that was kind of like my final thank you to him. He didn't, he probably didn't know who I was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I oh, really? Just, oh, no, no, he did. He did, he did know who I was, but I wasn't a friend. Yeah, yeah, okay. But what I'm trying to say is you can never underestimate the power of inspiration. Yeah. And, and Piers died at the end of that year and the award was given after his death. But you can never, and I guess it's why it's important to have people come and speak sometimes. You mm. can never, underestimate how someone can inspire you to go a different direction in yeah. your life and change your so that for me was a big turning point um and i think what that story of pierce sellers also tells us is that space gives us heroes by yes. the bucket load yeah, yeah and these aren't heroes who are out there shouting that they're heroes these are people who are quietly getting on with their jobs and doing things for humankind to benefit all of us because as you mentioned you said there were dips yeah. you know we went into space we had apollo and then there were these this lull almost in the 90s and the naughty but there wasn't. There was yeah. a huge amount of work going on. It's just it wasn't being shouted about. It was about learning how to use space to benefit us. Going into space to understand our planet's changing climate. You know, we had to go mm. to space to get the full evidence together to realize what's happening on Earth. You know, and as we respond to disasters and tragedies which are happening um, as a result of human-made climate change, it's space, images from space, which is helping us to understand how to better combat that you know, to look at the situation better and to try and solve the problem. So, you know, if you ask me why, why space is my passion, it, it's not just about the curiosity, actually. Uh, it is about the heroes, mm. the, the quiet heroes you get from space. And then it's about the fact that it affects all of us. Space might not seem important. Brexit might seem important. Yeah. Politics might seem important. But space is something which affects all of us and is shaping all of our lives every single day. And as we move forward, into, you know, over the next few decades, it's going to become more and more obvious that as humans expand their presence, so to speak, into the solar system, yeah. which sounds like science fiction, but it's better than science fiction because all of this is reality. So, so who's kind of, in terms of my ignorance of the dips and the drop, the dips and the peaks, I suppose they say, is that my ignorance or is that people in from the world of space, from the world of space, um, not shouting out, out enough about their achievements? to Joe Public? I wouldn't say it's that. I think um, it's going to take a lot to be seeing a human being set foot on the moon. Yes. Like, imagine, like, turning on your television, and television was where everyone got their news. You know, it was really part of, you know, nowadays we have smartphones mm. and, and the internet and everything, but television was the main form of media. You know, they had papers, but that was the main form of entertainment. And turning on your television at home and seeing a human being walk on the moon and then being able to go outside and look up and know that there are people there. That, that's mind-blowing. And it's something I didn't experience. It's something most people alive now haven't experienced. Mm. So we, it's going to take a lot to beat that in terms of imagination. But what's been going on instead is that subtly, actually, space has just become part of our oh, lives. Yeah. Space is about all of us now, whereas back then, space was just about two superpowers. But today... You know, if you were to get a map and colour in every single country which utilise space, you can colour in most of the world. It's not yeah. just about rich Western countries. It's not about two superpowers. There's no space race anymore. Instead, it's about lots of different countries often working together to use space to benefit Earth and also to go further into the solar system to answer fundamental questions. And then it's about private industry mm. and individuals who are people who made their fortune in the dot-com boom in the 1990s and investors who made a fortune investing in the dot-com yeah, yeah. boom who can see how an idea can come out of something out of nothing really you know who would have imagine if you could go back 25 years and buy shares in amazon yeah, yeah. i wish like, yeah don't we all wish <laughs> yeah, that yeah. and now people who did buy those shares you know 15 20 years ago mm. whatever they're now investing in space yeah. because they can see how the impossible becomes okay. possible and this kind of science fiction thing so it's yeah it's just a, a hugely exciting era we're now entering and we, we, we've had these seeming worlds mm. but they haven't been lost space has come about all, become about all of us and now because of hugely wealthy people a reduction in costs and, and the fact we've built up all these skills now space is about anyone 
with an idea. I'm sure it's a question you get asked a lot, but obviously it's, it's something we always want to know. What's next? Is there a new space race? What's going to be the next big thing? What, what can I get excited about? I think now is the most exciting term to be alive in terms of space exploration, because yes, we had the moon landings and that was huge, but now space is about all of us. You know, it's about all these countries around the world, you know, countries such as China, which are existing on the Mao, and many people didn't realize mm. humans had landed on the moon back in 1969. Now they're making huge success in space. They launch astronauts from China. You know, Taikonauts, they call them. But then it's also... So they call them Taikonauts. Ty- Taikonauts, not Taikonauts. Ty- Ty- <laughs> Ty- 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 um, but then it's also the Mavericks. People um, willing to have these crazy, bold ideas. Space is no longer about countries. It's also about individuals, mm. often individuals with deep pockets, but also people who have bold ideas and manage to convince people to, to fund these ideas. And space is set to be... A, um, a trillion dollar industry by the year 2040. There's a lot of money to be made in space. But in making money and chasing after that money and most people will fail, mm. what we're going to be doing is opening up this new frontier in a new way. I mean, within the next decade, the hope is that we'll see humans walk on the moon again. And imagine going out and looking up at the moon and knowing that there are humans there. Yeah. But this time it won't be about flags and footprints. It'll be about going to the moon longer term, having a permanent crewed base on the moon, having a a gateway in orbit around the moon, which will enable humans to actually get down to the surface. And then the moon will no longer be a place we go for politics, but a place we go to extend our presence away from Earth, just like the International Space Station has enabled us to do. And then perfecting all those skills, you know, how do we live in space? How do we grow food in space? How do we survive on the moon, even though it's only a few days away? Then it's about going to Mars. And that's something we could have potentially done in the 1980s, 1990s, yeah. if we'd carried on at the same rate as Apollo. But we didn't. But now, working internationally, the potential is that there is some little boy or girl at school right now who could be the first human being to walk on Mars. And that's not science fiction. And that's just incredible to think. You know, if you were to go back to 1900, imagine someone was born in the year 1900. Mm. What do they see within their lifetime? At three years old, they see the first flight. You know, um, the Wright brothers' first flight. Kitty Hawk moment. Yeah. Um, they see um, the Titanic, they see two world wars, they see commercial aviation becoming commonplace, then they see humans in space. At 69 years old, they see human beings walk on the moon, all within less than one human lifetime. Yeah. Now we look to our century and we look at you know the rate of acceleration is exponential. And we can imagine these things. We can talk about going back to the moon because we, we're pretty certain when well, we know it's going to happen mm. soon. We hope we're going to go to Mars, but then there's also all the things we can't imagine as well. Just like someone in 1900 couldn't imagine the yeah. events which unfolded in the last century. And all of us are part of making that future happen. It's our gift to the next generation when you work in the space industry. You know, people such as Jeff Bezos, they're, they're laying the foundations. You know, they're, they're making access to space more affordable so yeah. that the, the next generation can go that little bit further into space. So all these, these science fiction-like things, all the space age dreams that people had in the 1960s they're starting to come true now we just got the timing wrong so go on you've got (laughs) you've got the most incredible access and you see things and hear things and know things about the world give me your one bold prediction about what's going to happen in your in your lifetime that would pop up and kind of blow it goes back it goes back to um the boldest one is that we will prove that we're not alone that is what will happen within the next few decades. That is the boldest one because it changes everything. Um, obviously, commercial tourism and humans on, mir- on and, the moon. And, and you're, you're, com- you're confident that's going to happen in your, in your lifetime? In, yeah. In- the, the rate, we're likely not alone. We just, you know, as the cosmologist Carl, Carl Sagan said, you know, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. We just haven't got that mm. extraordinary evidence yet. And it sounds so ridiculous, but it, surely it's more ridiculous to think that you are alone. You know, you think that life only formed on this one planet. That's arrogant. Yeah. You know, yeah. whether there's intelligent life or not, that's completely different. But that is my boldest, um, you know, it'd be unfortunate if we were the most intelligent thing. <laughs> yeah. That is my boldest <laughs> prediction. Thought, and then my next one is that um, you've got to be an optimist when you work in the mm. space industry because people are sitting on rockets. You know, yeah. it's, it's a dangerous industry. Space has shown us that we can work together. So my next bold prediction mm. is that we will continue to work together because we have to because space is bigger than one company it's bigger than one nation yes. and we have to work together to go forward in space so my next bold prediction is 
that our return to the moon will be in, with international collaboration involved. And as we look forward to going into Mars, my bold prediction is that we won't go as one nation, one company, okay. we'll go as one world. Because when human beings set foot on the moon, they didn't say, you know, they were men from Earth. They want men from one country. Yes, mm. there was an American flag, but the plaque reads here, men from the planet Earth. Yeah. So when we go into space and we move forward, my bold prediction is that it will continue to unite us because all that divides us on Earth, we're united in this one planet. And when you think about it, really, Earth is a spaceship. It's just a very large yeah. one, but all of us are passengers. Do you think the it's going to be commercial or it's going to be governmental? We're just going to... Well, if you look back throughout history, um, and this is a bad example, I'm going to, I'm going to apologise yeah. for this example. Um, Columbus did a lot of things that we don't agree with now, looking back yeah. uh, on reflection. However, he was funded, um, is King and Queen of Spain who funded Columbus? Yes. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so the government funded exploration. And then you had the Mayflower setting yeah. sail, and it was private individuals. And actually what we're doing in space is nothing new. Okay. Governments okay. go first, then private industry follows. You know, Space is no longer a place to go. It's a place to do business, and it's an extension of who we are. We don't talk about sea industry or air industry, yeah. and soon we'll stop talking about um, a space industry. Yeah. And actually, my final bold prediction would be that we will get the first trillionaire to come from space, making money within the space industry. Yeah. Okay. Probably from data utilization, looking back at Earth. So let me ask my last question. Okay. And, and, and I, <laughs> I'll give you nine answers. Yeah, no, 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 but my, my last question, almost you'll get the answer to, to, to it, I know it's going to be both. But, I, but I, when you stand on stage speaking, what's your primary goal? Is it kind of in the short time we've been speaking of, here you inspire but you also you educate about space what what do you want the audience to feel from your perspective is it to look, to be more aware of everything that's going on in space and everything's going on in that or is it for people to follow their passions and to um do what they feel make sure they're going down the path that they've always wanted to go on i think that's a it's a great question i think you know as you said you know my answer but the, the truth is i just want people to look up a little bit more because we, we, we lose that, that spark, that childlike curiosity, but I want people to care more about space. And I think um, in doing so, in realising there's more out there, in realising how small we are in the, in the grandness of the universe, that then changes you. You know, there's a perspective shift which comes um, from astronauts when they look back at the Earth. Mm. They call it the overview effect. But, you know, we sent military personnel to the moon. Alan Shepard, who um, was the commander of Apollo 14, mm. When he stood on the surface of the moon and looked back at the Earth, he's this hardened military person. You know, he was the first American to travel into space. When he stood on the moon and looked back at the Earth, he cried. You know, and if that's what going to space and looking back can do to people, although I can't send everyone into space just yet, and that is changing, we are seeing a shift where more people will be able to access space. Mm. I want people to feel a little bit of that passion. Because everyone, not just children, you know, when I write children's book, that's great. Let's inspire children. Let's inspire the next generation. But everyone deserves to be inspired. Everyone deserves to have that change in perspective, which is what space gives us. And in turn, what that often does is make people readdress their own passions and think, you know, life is so short and we are so insignificant in the grandness of the universe. Within one mere human lifetime, we're not going to have all the answers. But what that inspiration looking up, being inspired a little bit more can do is, yes, it can help you to follow your dreams. It can make you realise what's important to do. How do you want to spend your time on this earth? And also, it helps you realise how fragile the planet is and the changes that we all make to make, so it's, or that we all need to make in order to look after our planet. So it's multifaceted, but really it just comes from more people realising that there's so much more out there waiting to be discovered. Brilliant. Listen, thank you so much for your time. I promise you, I'll get out there. I'm going to be, I'm going to be looking out there. Very well, <laughs> In cloudy London. Yeah, it's absolutely like a clear blue sky. As soon as I so thank you so much indeed. Thank you. Great to be here. Thank you. Cheers.